Good morning. We'll begin this morning with number 263, 263. Sing this song and then have our scripture reading and prayer. Wonderful words of life. Let's sing out together. Scripture reading this morning is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 17. We're going to look at verses 1 through 12. Here Luke is recording the, some of the missionary journeys of, of Paul. I think there's some very important lessons here as we enter our Bible classes. Acts 17, verses 1 through 12. And I'll be making a couple comments as we go. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis, in Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures. And I certainly have that underlined in my Bible. They, he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus, whom I preach to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul and Silas. We see the effect that reading, uh, explaining, and reasoning from the Scriptures had on those folks who were not Christians at the time. But the Jews who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace, and gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the, to the rulers of the city, crying, These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. I also have that underlined. He was giving Paul a compliment. He didn't realize it. But uh, you see the effect that Paul's method of teaching had on the areas that he went to. Jason had harbored them, and when these all... These are all acting contrary, excuse me, Jason had harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying, there is another king, Jesus. And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they had heard these things. So when they had taken security of Jason and the rest, they let them go. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went to the synagogue of the Jews. These, referring to the Jews, were more fair-minded than those of Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, all readiness, and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. 
Now, the fact that they had an open mind and an open heart, and they searched the scriptures to make sure that Paul was teaching the truth, and the result of that, in verse 12, therefore many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. We see the outcome of teaching others and reasoning with them from the scriptures and the effect that it can have. Thank you. And Father, we thank you for, the, for your word. We're thankful that we can understand your word. We're thankful that it guides our lives if we read it. We pray that you'll be with us this morning as we further study your word. We pray that we will have open minds, that we will seek the truth. We pray that you'll be with us this morning as we go to our classes. We pray for those that will be mentioned this morning as being sick. We pray that you'll bless them and help them to get well, if it be thy will. We pray that you'll be with us this morning as we meet around the Lord's table to remember your son's death. And we thank you for loving us enough to send your only begotten son. We also pray that you might forgive us of the sins that are in our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning. What a pleasure it is to see each of you this morning. Welcome to the Bremen Church of Christ for our Bible study period. We're thankful for your presence. We do have visitors among us this morning for which we are sincerely grateful. And we invite you back anytime you can be here. We'll dismiss now with the nursery, preschool, kindergarten, and elementary school classes. <laughs> Middle school, high school, and adult classes. Peter chapter 5, <clears throat> we'll continue to look at our study of this letter that Peter has written to try to encourage brethren, reminding them, as we've often noted and as Cliff noted repeatedly in the gospel meeting, that this is the true grace of God wherein these brethren are standing. <clears throat> and as a result of that, they are facing extreme difficulty. They're suffering persecution and their indications from this letter. And as we look back, we can understand as well from history that things got worse even after this letter was written. But it was written to encourage them to remain faithful. Remember the position that you occupy. Remember the people that you are. Remember <clears throat> now the perspective that you have and... Uh, Persecution is going to come, but he wants them to remain faithful in spite of whatever difficulties may come their way. Chapter 5 specifically has a reference to their persevering. What is it going to take for them to be able to maintain their faithfulness in spite of the difficulties that they're facing? That's really what chapter 5 is all about. <clears throat> As we've already noted in the first four verses of this chapter, he begins with what point? What's it going to take to get these brethren through the difficulties that they're going to face? 
proper leadership. Proper leadership. It shows Peter's respect for the eldership. It shows Peter's recognition of the, the value of leadership. And that is especially true during difficult times. <clears throat> How difficult is it to lead when everything is going exactly the way it ought to go? Doesn't take a lot of leadership there. But when things begin to uh, go in another way or, or difficulties come, in this case persecution, that's when the leadership of any people is really tested. That's true whether it's in the church, <clears throat> on the job, whatever the aspect of life might be. As long as everything is running well, doing as it should be doing, uh, you know, every, everything's okay. Leadership is happy. Things are going the way they ought to go. But when things begin to fall apart, people become unhappy. Difficulties begin to come. In this case, persecution arises. Brethren need good leadership. And that's when that leadership is tested. In the second place, we are currently looking at the idea in verses 5 through 8 <clears throat> that not only are they going to need good leadership, but they are going to need the proper clothing. Now again, as we emphasized when we started this point in our study last week, this is not talking about physical clothing. It's talking about spiritual clothing. We note it as well from Colossians chapter 3, in which Paul says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things above where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. And so now, and, and pretty much saying the same thing that Peter's saying here, you are no longer the same people you once were. Now you have a different perspective. Now you look at things differently. As a result of that, there are going to be persecutions. Now in that regard, in writing to the brethren at Colossae, Paul says, beginning in verse 5, mortify, put to death, put away from you certain things. Then beginning in verse 10, he tells them some things to put on. So in essence, he's doing there the very same thing that Peter's doing right here. In order to live a faithful Christian life in spite of what may come your way, <clears throat> there needs to be that proper clothing. And so he mentions some of the things involved in that uh, proper clothing when he talks about proper respect for those who are older. And as we mentioned in our study last week, he's not talking about uh, the elders here in, a, um, in an official sense, that is, elders of the church, but simply those who are older relative to those who are younger, showing the respect that younger people are to have for those who are older. How much do we need that lesson today? Probably as much as we need anything. Uh, we have a generation that is uh, coming along that, that seemingly has little respect for anybody, especially those who are older. So there's the proper respect that they're to have. In verses 5 and 6, he says they need to be clothed with humility. God resisteth the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. That's the way James words it. Peter in this verse says, verse 6, humble yourselves therefore unto the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you in due time. <clears throat> what is the exalting here? When and where will they be exalted? Well, we know for sure that if they endure the persecutions that come their way, they're going to be with Christ. Where is Christ? Hasn't He been exalted? To what point? Right hand of the Father. Go back to Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 5. Let this man be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, 
made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, made in the likeness of man, did what? Humbled himself. Humbled himself. And became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now what does Paul record immediately after he mentions that Christ humbled himself? And being exalted. Being exalted. Well, there's our example. You will uh, recall back in uh, chapter 3, <clears throat> and well, in both the uh, latter part of chapter 3 and chapter 4, Christ is set forth as our example. He's our example in every aspect of life, but in this particular case, He is our example of humility. And then who did the exalting? Even to Christ. God exalted Him. And so Peter in this regard says that if we will humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, that in due time God will exalt us. So we know that's one aspect of this idea of being exalted in due time. Do you find that phrase anywhere else that you can recall right off the cuff in due time that's used in the Scripture? <clears throat> in the Galatian letter, Paul said, Be not weary in well-doing. For what? In due season you shall reap if you faint not. So there's the same idea of, of in due season, in due time, in, in good time. Who's, who's time? Time of God's choosing, not ours. If we could choose the time, we'd choose to, to be out from under all of the difficulties of life, probably. But in due time, in due season, we shall reap, we'll be exalted, God will bless us. And that's what He wants these brethren to see. That regardless of what you're facing now, there is a time of exaltation coming. God will exalt you. But what's got to come first? Your humility. You've got to humble yourself where? Under the mighty hand of God. Now you think about that phrase as Peter puts this together. They're enduring persecution. How are they going to get through it? Are they going to be able to get through it by themselves? No. Who's going to help them through it? The mighty hand of God is going to help them get through it. Because he's going to say in the very next verse, do what? Casting all your care on him. For he cares for you. And so here's the mighty hand of God who's going to not only help them through these difficulties, but in due time He's going to exalt them. If they will remain faithful, if they will not grow weary in their well-doing. So, so there's the concept of this chapter, the perseverance that they must have in order to remain faithful as children of God. Now, there are so many verses in the Proverbs probably would do us good from time to time to, to take a, a concordance and find all of the references where the idea of humility is expressed and read those verses and, and consider the context in which they are found and, and learn of the benefits of humbling ourselves under the mighty hand of God. I've probably mentioned this before, probably will again. But on one occasion I heard it said or read it somewhere, when you think about the idea of, of being proud and the opposite of, of humility, being arrogant, man is made from what? Dust of the ground. He was redeemed by what? the blood of the Lamb. 
of what do we have to be so proud. When you think about our beginning, you think about what's been done for us along the way, what do we have to be so proud about? What do we have to boast about? And so it'll help keep us maybe and keep our proper perspective of who we are and what we are, the need to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. And of course, that humility is, is shown in our <clears throat> action toward one another, how we respond, how we react to, to one another in, in uh, life's journey. In the Galatian letter, chapter 5, and this is the same letter, remember, that he talks about our not being weary in well-doing. But in Galatians chapter 5 and in verse 13, he says, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. What is humility going to cause us to do relative to one another. It's going to cause us to serve one another. Well, what's the problem? Whenever we find those among us who do very little in the way of serving others, but seemingly are always demanding that people serve them, what's the problem? It's not a humility, is it? It's pride and arrogance. Who are we? that we should expect people to serve us. We ought to be the ones who are looking to serve. Jesus made that abundantly clear during His earthly ministry. Who is great among you? Your servants. Servants. And so that's, that's what humility will, will bring about in our lives. For all the law, I'm still in Galatians 5 here, verse 14, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So in, in that context, Paul is saying the very same thing that Peter's saying right here. Humility will cause the right reaction on our part toward others. Cause us to desire to be servants, not desire to be served. That's how we should respond to one another. But it'll also be seen in our reaction to God. How do we respond to God? How do we know how we respond to God? Well, we know how we respond to His Word. If we ignore God's Word, how are we responding to God? We're ignoring God. And so we need to have that degree of humility. That's how we're going to get through. These brethren are facing difficult times, are going to face more difficult times ahead. What's going to help them get through that? being there for one another. That's what he's really saying in this context. When brethren are suffering, who's going to be there to pick them up? They're brethren. They're brethren. That's how a lot of the service is going to take place in their caring for one another to the best of their ability. But then in verse 7, not only does he mention that they need to be clothed with proper respect for those who are older, not only do they need to be clothed with humility, but he said they also need to be clothed with trust. In this particular case, trust in God. Casting all your care on Him, for He careth for you. We mentioned a section. You might want to turn back to it just briefly. In uh, Matthew chapter 8, <clears throat> beginning in verse 23, and 
when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves. But he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. In whom were they putting their trust? Well, at least in that particular case, at this point, even though he goes on to say, Oh, you little faith, it's, at least they still knew where to go, didn't they? In order to be saved from that particular situation. You remember when Peter tried to walk on the water? He began to see the boisterous waves around him, took his eyes off the Lord. What happened to him? Began to sink. What did he do? Began to swim feverishly back to the ship? No, he called upon the Lord to save him. Trust. Do you ever feel like in life you're beginning to sink? Things are going so badly for you that you just feel like there's no way out? In whom do you put your trust? Men? Yourself? Nobody? Or do you put your trust in the Lord? In uh, Paul's writing to the church at uh, Corinth, he emphasizes to him a, a principle that I think sometimes we maybe misapply a little bit. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, <clears throat> he begins this chapter by talking about the things of the past, past history of Israel, how they had uh, come out of Egyptian bondage, first two or three verses there. Um, then you come on down to verse 6. He says, These things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted, neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, and neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, fell in one day three and twenty thousand, neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also were tempted and were destroyed of serpents, neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happen in them for examples, for they are and are and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Now look at verse twelve. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. What's going to cause the man to fall? Well, let me rephrase that. Who is going to cause a man to fall? The man himself, but who's behind it? Satan's behind it, isn't he? Satan's behind it. What does Peter say here in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8? The devil, as a roaring lion, walking about, seeking whom he may devour. And so the devil's hard at work, isn't he? Just the last couple of days in a conversation with an individual in a discussion of some things that are happening in, an, in another congregation not real close to here, but just looking at the way things were developing, the comment was made, it never ceases to amaze us how the devil works. He can always come up with some way to destroy good works. Well, what does Peter say? He's like a roaring lion walking about, seeking whom he may devour. What does Paul say to these brethren in Corinth? You may think you're standing, but you better take heed or you'll fall. Why? The devil's after you. The devil's after you. But now the encouraging part is in verse 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. 
Then he encourages them to flee idolatry. What's he saying to these brethren? You're not going to face anything that others have not faced along the way. What you're facing is common to other brethren as well. When Peter talks to these folks over here and he, he encourages them to, to cast all their care on, on the Lord, put your trust in Him, that's the message that we need, isn't it? Trust in the Lord. Various passages in the Bible teach that, but I want you to notice something, especially in verse 13, <clears throat> where he said that, that God's not going to suffer you to be tempted above that you're able. But I'm going to read this like I think a lot of people perceive that it is written. But will with the temptation also make you escape? Is that what it says? does not say that God is going to make you escape temptation. Who has to make that choice? We do. What is God going to make? A way of escape. But if we choose not to escape, we can't blame it on God, can we? He's provided the way, but we have to make the choice to follow his way. So what does that basically say? I'm going to put my trust in God. Through my life, as temptation comes my way, I'm going to put my trust in His way of escape. What is that way? Well, He's given it to us in His Word. We follow His Word. It's not going to lead us into temptation, is it? It's going to lead us away from temptation. If we ignore His Word, if we ignore His way, then we'll lead ourselves into temptation. And so Peter here, along with Paul and the others, are just simply saying to them, Brethren, you can do this. I think if there's probably one word maybe that would, would summarize the, the intent of the letter of 1 Peter, it would be the word hope. There's hope. When you think about the position you occupy, the people you are, the perspective that you have, in spite of the persecutions that you're going to face, you can persevere, you can overcome. There is hope. Do we need that in our lives? Sure we do. So in verse 7, he's simply saying, saying to them, He cares for you. Put your trust in Him. <clears throat> and obviously, as we noted in the outline, who better could probably understand this concept than Peter? Who was involved in those circumstances that we just talked about? The storm in the, in the sea about to wreck the ship, they thought. And Peter himself trying to walk on the water, having to plead for the Lord to save him. Not that, not that the Lord is going to save us in the same miraculous way that he did on those occasions. Yet Paul says he has provided a way of escape from temptation. He's not going to put more on us, not going to tempt us above that we're able to bear. That's what these people that Peter's writing to need. Incidentally, I kind of question a common use of, of 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. What is the context of 1 Corinthians 10 13? Temptation, temptation. And yet oftentimes it is applied to just the burdens of life, the trials and tribulations of life. If you read James chapter 1, you'll learn that there is a distinction between the, the, the burdens, the trials, the tribulations that we face in life and temptation that we face in life. James makes that distinction. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul was dealing specifically with temptation. God's not going to allow us to be tempted beyond what we can deal with and escape if we'll just follow His way. Now it is true that God has promised to be with us in every aspect of life. Hebrews chapter 13, we can boldly say, The Lord is my helper. 
I'll not fear what men do to me. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And so these brethren needed that lesson so badly that you, you, you can endure. You can deal with these, these trials and tribulations and persecutions that you're facing. But who's going to help you do it? You're going to have to recognize the help of the Lord in all that you're doing. So you have to put on trust. That's a part of the proper clothing that he's mentioning in this context. Then in verse 8, he says, be sober. There's another garment, if you please, or piece of clothing in the, the spiritual list here. There's respect, there's humility, there's trust, there's soberness. What, is, what does it mean to be sober? It means you hadn't touched the bottle lately, right? Well, in principle, that's what it really means, isn't it? What does, what does strong drink do for you? It destabilizes your thinking, doesn't it? That's why we use the word sober relative to the, you know, those who have not used alcoholic beverages. They're sober. It means their thinking is not altered by the use of some foreign substance. But is, is alcohol the only thing that can affect our thinking? Not at all. Been uh, one of the... Um, lessons that, that we're going to be doing in Vacation Bible School that we've been working on. Uh, we're, it's going to deal with the flood, but, you know, if you, under, if you don't understand some of the background, you're not going to appreciate the flood itself. What's in the background of that flood? The sons of God saw some beautiful women, and they were blinded by passion. And what happened? Their thinking got screwed up. They were no longer sober in their thinking as a result of those beautiful women. There are a lot of things in life that can mess up our thinking, get us off base, off track. And so that's why in this particular case, Peter would say, if you're going to be able to endure whatever it is you have to endure as a child of God, you need to be clothed with right thinking. Keep your thinking straight. Don't allow the things of the world to change that. Again, considering the context and the persecution through which these brethren were having to go and would have to go in a more severe way. What's going to be the temptation probably for them? Well, you go back to the scene of the night of our Lord's arrest. What was the temptation to which Peter yielded on that night? Huh? Well, that was, yeah, earlier in the garden, but I'm, I'm thinking later now. Denial of the Lord. Why? Well, if they're fixing to crucify the Lord, what are they going to do to him if he acknowledges that, that I'm with him? And so when he was accused, this guy is one of them. He said, I don't know what you folks are talking about. I don't know. Cursed and swore and said, I don't know the man. Well, here these people are. In all probability, some of them are going to, to be facing death. What's going to be the temptation? Oh, no, wait a minute. Maybe I'm not as committed to this cause as I thought I was. Maybe I'm not as bold. Maybe I'm not as strong as I thought I was. Maybe I need to rethink. Temptation to give in and yield to the pressures of, of the persecution and not be faithful. It is. It, we don't think about it so much in our own country, but there are areas, if you read some of the mission reports that come through, um, you'll, you'll find that there are areas of the world where there still is persecution taking place of our own brethren. And so here's the temptation. So what does he say to them? Don't let these pressures of life 
affect your thinking. Be sober. And then he says, be vigilant. What does that word mean? Be watchful. Be watchful. I suppose the word watchful is about as close as we could get to it otherwise. Be watchful. Watchful for what? Well, in this particular case, be watchful of the fact that the devil is trying to destroy your faith. Who's responsible for the persecution, ultimately? The devil. He's the one. I mean, men are involved in it. They are the instruments. Have you ever thought about the fact God's will is carried out through whom? Men. Men. Human instrumentality. Carrying out the will of God. Who carries out the will of the devil? Men. Other men. <coughs> other men. You remember a reference where the angels, the, the, the uh, servants of the devil, transform themselves into angels of light? And so human instrumentality is responsible for carrying out the will of the devil as well as the will of God. And so while there are men involved in the persecution of these brethren, the devil is ultimately responsible for it. So you be watchful for ways that the devil is trying to destroy your faith. Don't let it happen. Be watchful. I think may be involved in this as well. The idea of vigilance and, and watchfulness is, is kind of wrapped around that idea of hope as well. There's coming a time when you're not going to be able to, when you're not going to have to endure like this. So he's encouraging them to, to carry through with their life, put on the proper clothing, and the reason is stated as we've already noted in uh, verses, um, in the latter part of verse 8, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So in verses 8, the latter part of verse 8 through verse 11, and this is where we're going to pick up in our study next week, He's trying to help them see and realize that one can overcome the devil. Easily? No. You think of all the references that might come to mind. Put on the whole armor of God? What does that suggest? We're at war. Be a good soldier of the cross? What does that suggest? War. War. Endure hardness as a good soldier of Christ. What does that suggest? War. And so there's so many passages like that, that that simply say to us, we are in a war. We're in a battle. And if we think we can just float along through life and everything's going to be great for us, you have not been working with this book enough. Because it'll tell you otherwise. You're not going to live a faithful Christian life and everything turn up roses for you. But you can overcome it. You can endure it. You can ultimately, in due season, be exalted if you'll follow God's direction. All right, we'll pick up there, Lord willing, next Sunday morning.